want to first say that I am not Bernie Carl. Um, wish I were, but I'm not. I uh, occupy a unique place in Alaska. Uh, I grew up uh, out of high school as a chef. Um, that's all I knew for about six years. And, and when I moved to Alaska, uh, my entire life changed. Um, and a lot of that change had to do with the people that surrounded me. And I think this is a, a common experience for many Alaskans that uh, uh, our community is, is new and changing and dynamic, uh, but supportive and based on a huge uh, history and tradition of caring about one another. I uh, have worked most often uh, over the last few years with emerging leaders, and emerging leaders approach issues differently. Um, at the same time, I operate on a whole other level of engaging in Arctic governance, uh, Arctic uh, infrastructure issues, and it's really been my privilege uh, just in the last few years to learn more about what Alaska's role in the Arctic looks like and means, and a lot of that is shaped by where we are in the world. Um, a lot of where we are is defined by other people, and you'll probably be familiar with this map, a map that shows us Alaska uh, as part of Mexico. Um, sometimes you'll see Alaska off the, uh, a lot of times you'll see Alaska off the coast of California. Uh, every once in a while you'll see it um, in the right spot. I think that a lot of where Alaska, they're upside down on purpose. Um, <laughs> a lot of how we think of ourselves as Alaskans is upside down. Uh, it's defined by where other people put us. And in that same way that community has surrounded me and, and I am uh, lucky in those that uh, I've been surrounded by and who have supported me, I think uh, Alaskans happen, have an opportunity to define better where we are and, and, and who we want to be surrounded by. And, and here we're constantly looking down at a, at a capital in D.C. that's you know, 4,000 miles away. It takes me longer to get to D.C. than it does to get to Iceland. Um, and it's this sense of place, or this distorted sense of place, that really uh, engages Alaskans in an Alaska exceptionalism, this need to uh, put our stamp on the world, or at least show them how much bigger we are uh, than any other state, uh, to show them how uh, distant uh, the Aleutian chain is from Barrow and Barrow to, to Sitka. Um, we, are, we are driven by our sense of, of how we are unique in the world, how we're bigger, um, and how America should respond to us. Um, and it's unfortunate because we've got so much to offer each other and uh, the rest of the United States and the rest of the world that I think um, this sense of place, this upside down feeling uh, has really changed um, what we look forward to in life. And, and I want to say that you know, our neighborhood uh, is in the Arctic. And that our neighbors are Canada and Russia. Um, our, uh, the eight Arctic nations that is, is our little neighborhood are the people that we should be caring about, people we should be modeling ourselves off after. Um, it's the citizens in Norway and Finland, in Faroe Islands and Greenland. Uh, that share our world, that share this sense of being Arctic, of being northern. And it's the circumpolar north that is our community. So when you look at maps and you see Alaska and Mexico are off the coast of California, uh, remind yourselves that our approach to the world needs to be different. And, and the people to determine that difference are Alaskans but not relative to the United States, not relative to North Dakota or Arizona or Miami, relative to this neighborhood. The drivers facing, I guess, uh, Arctic issues in Alaska are many. And, and probably you see news stories that um, have something to do with sea ice or polar bears or uh, a Russian fuel delivery of, uh, to Nome. Um, it's interesting, I, I heard that, that that delivery wouldn't have happened um, when the Russian captain found out that it was a female captain on the Healy. Uh, he almost turned around. So those kind of stories that Alaskans should be 
uh, understanding of. We should be paying attention to those things. Um, and, and we don't need to sensationalize them. It, there's no sense in calling the Bering Strait or the Northern Sea Route the next Panama Canal. These are our reality. Um, we have a state motto that is north to the future. And 50 years ago, uh, that was aspirational. Uh, that was who we wanted to be and who we wanted the world to see us as. Today, that's our starting point. The north has always been the future for Alaskans. A lot of what you see when it comes to Arctic issues are the changes taking place. And so you can see sea ice extent, um, uh, the change that's taken place since 1979, between 1979 and 2007. Um, but how many Alaskans know what that looks like or know what that means? Maybe you've heard about uh, the volume of sea ice and how it's changed drastically in, in the, in, uh, the prior, uh, past few years. Um, changes of 55% less. Uh, than what it looked like in 1979. And a lot of these, the, the narrative around change doesn't necessarily come from Alaskans. It comes from the lower 48. It comes from uh, the media and uh, scientists around the world. Um, but I don't know how much Alaskans are really paying attention to things like this. Alaskans start with Alaskans. Uh, we start with the people who live here. And people of the north start with the people of the North. You know, I saw uh, a recent commentary, um, I think it was the National Science Foundation, or a recent publication, that said, we should be paying attention to the Arctic because there's change taking place in the Arctic, and it's affecting the physical infrastructure. And I have to wonder, maybe they didn't realize that there are people who live up there. Um, maybe they don't know that there are communities uh, scattered uh, around the circumpolar North. And that's the starting place, it's the people. For Alaskans, you know, we see our futures changing based on that, that not just the infrastructure, but the, our physical surroundings. Um, sure, climate change is a driver uh, facing Alaska's Arctic issues. Um, in 2070, when uh, permafrost is uh, gone from many communities around the state, um, I think that we'll be very uh, clear in our sense of who we start with and where we start. And it's not uh, holding that back. It's being able to put in place the response necessary for those kinds of changes. And Alaska should be at the table. Um, one of Alaska's drivers in Arctic issues, or one of our sense of, of what the drivers could be, uh, has to do with the resources, the resource potential. And you'll hear uh, many people talk about a race for resources. It's not a race for resources. There's the reality that there are resources in the North that with change, there will be increasing activity and people looking for uh, opportunity. Alaska's role is to understand what that opportunity looks like, to make sure that when we're talking about development, uh, we're also talking about responsibility, response capacity, and, um, and conservation. I think it was too often we, we take environment and uh, development uh, and separate them, and, and it's really all part of the idea of development and sustainable development. One of the drivers, maybe, is just the increased traffic um, through the Bering Strait. It's not the Panama Canal. Um, this is just the reality. Increased traffic through the Bering Strait, increased traffic uh, along the Northern Sea Route, uh, more tonnage last year over the Northern Sea Route than at any time in history. Um, with resources from, from Russia, from Norway, from Europe, coming around and, and over during a, f a short period, three to four months. Um, traffic in the Northern Sea Route uh, isn't year round and it's not going to be for a long time. Um, but these are the things that Alaskans should be paying attention to. Alaska's response. Um, here's uh, on the left our outer continental shelf, our exclusive economic zones. These are terms that Alaskans need to understand. Uh, our response base is, is in, uh, in Kodiak Island. For, uh, to get from Kodiak to Barrow is the distance from Seattle to San Francisco. A thousand miles, roughly. Um, and what does, that, what does that mean when you think of response? What happens if something occurs off our north coast? This is something the Alaska State Legislature has looked at um, over the last 18 months in the Northern Waters Task Force. And, uh, there's a bill now to create an Arctic Policy Commission. We're slowly getting to this point that we should be taking an active role in deciding um, what 
Alaska's position is and priorities are in this discussion. This is some of the, the routing um, in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, this is some of the activity, and activity is, is fisheries, maybe. Uh, it's a lot of research going on, a lot of exploration. There are six Arctic countries that are actively exploring for oil and gas development um, or developing those resources. Uh, this is community resupply. This is summer uh, barges going around the coast and, and bringing in fuel and, and other materials. And let's just say, this is hypothetical, but let's say these are the response bases that are around the Arctic. And in an hour, um, you get this far to respond to uh, a situation. In two hours, maybe, this is how far you get. In four hours, this is how far you get. What if those lines ran into uh, borders? What do we do? I'll bet the picture changes drastically. And I, I think you can see, uh, have some glimmer of the sense of the gaps that are out there. If something were to happen in the high Arctic, um, who's responsible? Uh, what's responsible? The Arctic Council has um, spent a lot of time. The Arctic Council is the premier place for addressing Arctic issues. It's the eight Arctic nations around a table with six permanent participants. Permanent participants um, represent indigenous uh, perspectives, and they have uh, an equal vote. They've got a voice at the table. Uh, these are, uh, this is an organization that Alaskans need to be engaged with, and I had the uh, honor of being at some of the oil spill task force negotiations going on here in Girdwood um, just this past week. And we had three ambassadors down there uh, from Russia, the United States, and Norway uh, discussing what response looks like. This is the agreement um, and the zones of responsibility they articulated uh, when they uh, drafted the search and rescue agreement. The oil spill task force agreement um, is hoping to produce something similar. But, you know, a lot of this is, is looking at, so here's some of the traffic. Um, it, this in no way describes the traffic uh, of hunting or fishing. Uh, these are some of the big concerns that, that people are paying attention to. Uh, and they're paying attention because we don't want something like this to happen, right? Um, we don't have the infrastructure in place to respond. And, and this ship in, the Antarct in Antarctica um, got lucky in that there was a ship nearby that uh, could rescue those passengers. Um, Alaska's agenda has to do with three things. We do give a damn what they do outside. We should give a damn what they do outside. We need to build our public awareness and public understanding of what Arctic issues look like. For as much as we say that uh, the U.S. is an Arctic nation because Alaska is an Arctic state, I don't know that we think like Arctic people. Um, we don't think of what's going on in Russia and Canada and Iceland. And that's the challenge. The opportunity is acting uh, as a model of cooperation. And, and certainly in the Arctic Council, uh, that's one opportunity for that cooperation. But there are a number of subnational organizations um, that also uh, provide cooperative models. This is what my sense of governance in, in the Arctic looks like. And so at the center, you've got this Arctic elite, maybe, the people who are at the, te at the table, the people who are making decisions. Uh, these are academics who are constantly addressing uh, the physical changes taking place. Uh, this is federal agencies and national governments um, who are voting based on national and strategic interests. Um, the second sphere are the people who wish they had a voice at the table. So this is a lot of the independent sector, uh, ENGOs, environmental, uh, non-governmental organizations. This is indigenous people um, putting out their uh, priorities relative to the decisions they'd like to see made. Uh, and the rest is the rest of us. People have no idea there is a table. Uh, people who don't know that the Arctic Council exists. And a recent poll shows that, for the most part, Americans have no idea that there's an Arctic Council. <laughs> right? And that's scary. Um, even more scary is, is half of America doesn't know that there should be something that addresses Arctic issues. And, and Alaskans have a role as, as ambassadors, as citizens to broaden America's understanding of why this is important. And, and ha we have to work to educate people that there's even uh, something more than a, a polar bear, uh, a Coca-Cola commercial or something uh, going on up here. That, that it is about us. Um, it's about the peoples of the North and, um, and our priorities. Uh, how they do it outside, uh, 
there's three, I guess, components. Uh, one of those components is the vision. You need a, a strong group of people, uh, state government, national government, to, and, and citizens to articulate a vision. Um, that vision needs to look at the scenarios uh, ahead of us, right? Given the range of variables out there, what could happen? Um, and leadership. Uh, somebody has to start that conversation. The second is a framework. We need a strategic plan. Uh, and maybe something like the Arctic Policy Commission um, puts in place a uh, strategic plan. We need to be able to identify the key stakeholders. And we don't get to pick and choose, right? Uh, we don't get to say, well, just urban people get to decide, or just rural people get to decide, or indigenous, non-native, native, uh, maybe just legislator, maybe just the legislature gets to decide. It's got to be everybody. Um, and there's, there's got to be representative voices at the, at the table to be able to really understand all the priorities. Um, and then implementation. And I say state directed, and I don't mean uh, command and control, Soviet Union type state direction. I mean the state needs to take a leadership role. Um, and there needs to be state, uh, community, federal investment in all of these opportunities. Uh, recognizing that the private sector has a strong role. There's more, Shell has more response capacity on the North Slope than the U.S. government. Shell's got more infrastructure in northern Alaska than the, than the U.S. government. And there's got to be public will. There's got to be an understanding that the intersection between public and private um, is, is vibrant, is dynamic, um, but is something we can shape. So strategic planning for an Arctic state maybe starts with local and traditional knowledge. We have a, have a, we have a tradition um, here that goes back thousands of years, and it's important to recognize uh, that history, but also the, the, the newer history that uh, is out there. We have subnational perspectives and groups like the Northern Waters Task Force, Penwar, uh, State of Alaska, um, can articulate that. And then there's circumpolar collaboration that needs to happen. And Arctic issues are defined, I think, by what takes place in the circumpolar north. So understanding that, that yes, it's a model of, co of cooperation, but it's also where our sphere of understanding uh, needs to relate to. Uh, Governor Hickel always said that it, it's, uh, the Arctic's about people, people's needs, and the environment. And for me, this is a model of sustainable, sustainable development. And I think that's a good starting place for any strategic plan. Um, Yes, Alaska is unique. Yes, uh, there's a great sense of Alaska exceptionalism. Um, but we need to recognize that we're also Americans, we're also peoples of the North, and, and be able to articulate the, the many, uh, not just perspectives, um, but our priorities, our values, our principles for engaging in these issues. Thank you very much.